Hi comrades. Uh, we have a very important mobilization coming up December 20th. I just passed out the uh, leaflets and many of you will be glad to see that we're doing something to take on this fascist so-called presidential candidate Donald Trump um, who gets who's been given a pass by the media and quite frankly the movement um, and uh, you'll see we have uh, lots of endorsers already um, we had the first meeting Tuesday night to launch this and we had about 30 people there um, you know lots of great groups um, the Free Mumia campaign, the Laundry Workers Center, uh, the Ayotzinapa Student Front, People's Organization for Progress, uh, Occupy Wall Street activists. Um, we definitely understand what the Muslim community is facing right now. Um, in Boston just yesterday a woman g uh, got on the train with her laptop which was in a bag. Um, she was assaulted uh, physically, uh, excuse me, verbally assaulted. People said she's got a bomb. She opened it, just say, no, this is my computer. And some people look, walked up to her to, to look at it, saw that it was a computer, and then just backed away. And nobody apologized to her. And this is the kind of thing that uh, people in the Muslim community are facing now, in addition to many other things that people uh, obviously are hearing about. So um, we know that we understand what the Muslim community is facing, and we are taking on this task of continuing with this demonstration. It's, it's going to be a grassroots response. And I personally don't think it's so bad that the main response to this culture of anti-Muslim bigotry be organized by non-Muslims. And I think that right now, we frankly need more white and non-Muslim people to take a stand against this. Um, you know, the media, all, I'm sure everybody's heard, the progressive movement often points out the backlash that happens, say, against Muslims when there's an attack, when, when something like this happens. But also the bourgeois media very often reports on it. They often talk about the backlash that um, Muslim people will face after whatever. And it's not, the media does not uh, shy away from covering people talking about their oppressions. They don't do it in a progressive way, but mostly they don't, they never do it in a way that builds solidarity with them. And like one example, just one facet of this these days, it's a modern thing with the internet is you can have some article about a Black Lives Matter demonstration or uh, protests of Muslims or LGBTQ people online and then the comment section is just filled with the most right-wing racist garbage that you could imagine. And unless there's an intervention by the people, there's no real sense of solidarity. And this is very just similar to the whole Trump phenomenon itself. I mean, the Black Lives Matter movement for the last year, the leadership has been African American, mostly women, many LGBTQ people, and it's been an inspiring movement. And the composition of every demonstration is usually a quarter to a half, sometimes two thirds or more are white. So the, the, the whole phenomenon of the Black Lives Matter movement has been one of anti-racist unity. But what's sort of erased that from public consciousness is the Trump candidacy, where now that Trump gets all this media attention, it's kind of like, well, the Black Lives Matter movement's over here, and then we have this uh, racist candidate who at some point, it seems like he's just speaking for white America. And so, and uh, what's, what sort of propelled him, it's clear to everybody here, is the constant media exposure. When he started out, he wasn't like someone who had a real constituency. And he 
was ahead in the polls, but the polls were like, th there was a huge field, lots of, you know, candidates, and for him to be leading the polls didn't represent a huge section of the population, but it got promoted as if it did. And, and just, I mean, every time, when I open my laptop, it immediately goes to a Yahoo news page. Every time this summer I opened up my Yahoo page, but the latest thing, the latest bigoted utterance from Trump, the latest thing Trump did, just constant, constant. And it, you can see this as the, the, the uh, bourgeoisie's response to the Black Lives Matter movement. We're going to push racism harder. And there's, even though he didn't really represent anybody at first, there's been sort of a, a dialectical path where now that he's been given such a megaphone, he's emboldened the fascists, emboldened the right wing, emboldened the racists, and now his, his uh, campaign rallies are like fascist rallies. And you have, uh, you know, um, the Planned Parenthood shooting and the, and the Minneapolis shooting. Um, the Minneapolis shooting, I think people, many people probably heard that how these fascists, when they left, and there's a video of it that got pretty wide exposure, this, one of them just, these people had masks on, and they walked back to this car, and the person driving the car had like a, a patch on his arm, which was a, from the police department. And this got widespread coverage. What also was true, which I didn't see as much, but I did see it on Democracy Now!, is um, before that happened, before these fascists came up and attacked the rally, they, they came with masks on. Before that happened, about a half hour before that, they were sort of I occupying the entrance of a police station. Somebody from the police department poked their head out and had a mask on and looked at them and then came back in, clearly letting them know what was ha that they had paramilitary help. So this is sort of the new stage of the movement that we're facing. Um, just like a quick word about San Bernardino. I mean, we, it's pretty much said by the great statement. I was going to hold it up, but it looks like I probably passed it out when I was attempting to pass out leaflets. Well, people have it on there. I mean, this is such a great statement, and I just want to emphasize the section about war. I mean, first of all, I would just like to say that it's being used so intensively for racism that I, I probably like others, are looking at this very carefully to see what exactly they're saying and to see if I can find any holes in this official explanation. And it does stand out to me that almost all the facts are coming from the police department. I can't, I haven't seen any statement from any coworker who was shot who said like, why did my, you know, coworker do this? I didn't, there's one guy that they talked to who was in the bathroom so he didn't actually see the shooting. But everything is coming from the police department right now. Apparently today, now they're saying that, um, the woman who they're accusing of this said something supporting ISIS on her Facebook page the day before it happened, uh, the, the morning that it happened. So maybe this really happened the way they said it did. Oh, okay. So, so there's a lot of, that they're trying to sell. Okay. Even if it happened the way they said it did, I would just like to reemphasize this point about war. Why doesn't the U.S. just stop bombing Syria? If this is a problem that there's, if they're so concerned about this kind of terrorism, why don't they stop bombing Syria? This is, this is just so, it, it exposes the hypocrisy of their concern about terrorism and their focus, aside from the fact that they never even go after right-wing terrorists in the United States and the racists and the people who shoot up abortion clinics. This, this simple fact of just the constant wars should expose their hypocrisy when they talk about this and try to push it nonstop in the media like they're doing right now. Um, and so I just want to report a little bit on some of the discussions we had while we're planning this rally. Um, at the planning rally, some, one of the activists from People's Organization for Progress, Amanufu, he said, we, we've got the word fascist all over this leaflet that we had at the time. He said, the average person doesn't know like we do what that means. And I think it's, I, as I thought about it, I think to a lot of people who aren't in the movement, it just seems like a, a slur that leftist people use against right-wing people. And I don't think they hear it in the way that we mean it often. Um, and in some ways, it, it would be good for us to, 
I'm not going to do a lot of definitions of fascism. I think that we should do that in the discussion. Um, in some ways, the legacy of slavery in the U.S. has it means it doesn't, you know, fascism isn't needed the way that it's needed in Europe. Um, it's not relied on in the same way. That role is pretty much played by the legacy of slavery and what and and the continuation of white supremacy. Um, and although that doesn't necessarily explain what's happening now, because there does seem to be a, some kind of fascist movement occurring now, and what is causing that? Um, I went back and looked at uh, Trotsky's pamphlet, "What Is Racism and How to Fight It." Fascism. I'm sorry, yeah. What thinks? What is fascism and how to fight it? Um, you know, that was a ver also he was mostly dealing with countries at that time which had had actual revolutionary movements. And he, but he really called out as one big aspect, he felt that the, the lack of revolutionary leadership or the refusal by revolutionary leadership to sort of carry things through to a final revolution is really what, what um, caused fascism in each case. And, uh, and a lot of times it's just a, pop it's a populist um, pseudo concern with workers, plight, but then it is funneled into racism or scapegoating of immigrants um, like Lou Dobbs used to do. I even remember about 10 years ago, there was a logging town uh, somewhere in the Midwest and the, the logging company was very uh, exploitive and laid people off and made people's lives miserable, but there were people who were able to direct that anger against environmental protesters and environmentalists got killed. And so that's, that can be a feature of it too. Um, and also it, it helps to keep in, t in mind it's part of a global thing. There's the golden dawn in Greece. Uh, capitalism creates the need for fascism wherever it is, and especially in a time of capitalist crisis. And we can't leave out what's happening in France right now, where they use this attack again. That attack should have been a warning signal to stop bombing Syria to the French, French government. Instead, they've raided over 2,000 people's homes. Uh, most of the people that they're raiding are Muslim. Um, they have detained hundreds of people. They've got hundreds of people under house arrest. They've raided seven mosques. They've shut down three mosques. Um, they raided one Muslim family and sprayed a six-year-old with a shrapnel. And so this is also the context that we have to see all this in. Um, I think that just for our purposes, <laughs> It's useful to see the need for the bourgeoisie, the need for the ruling class to push back against the, against the Black Lives Matter movement, which start has spread like wildfire to every city. Um, and, f and when capitalism feels threatened, they, they want to just crush whatever they see that threatens them. This happened with Occupy Wall Street. There were you know, encampments in every city. But the social character of, of Occupy Wall Street was different than the social character of the people who fought back in Ferguson. And the, uh, the repression and the racism in, uh, and the oppression of people who live, of African American people who, li who lived in Ferguson is a, was a lot greater. And of course people have seen, you know, the way that mass incarceration was used there along with constant harassment through parking tickets, uh, speeding tickets, just a complete immersion in the, uh, the state apparatus, and I mean, I, I think the fact came out that in Ferguson they issued more arrest warrants than there were residents of Ferguson. So, I mean, the people of Ferguson fought back every single night, and it wasn't encampments where once they got rid of the encampment, that's it. They, people went home, and they came back and fought the cops the next day. And once this, once this resistance set in, it spread to every city, and the ruling class, now in the time, this time of economic crisis, has to resort to promoting somebody like Trump who can then unleash uh, more violent forces against this movement, which is actually, when it's not being repressed in the media, is very inspiring to people. And um, I think we should see Trump's candidacy and the phenomenon that he's leading it's um, our need to, to build a people's movement through this, and hopefully this demonstration will really be the start of that. It's important, and it's also important to see this as 
in its totality. A lot of progressives are saying, well, you know, Hitler got elected too. This is, this is the rise of fascism. This is the way that the, the word fascism is sometimes misused. I mean, if Trump doesn't get elected, that doesn't mean that this movement failed for the bourgeoisie. They could use him and increase the fascist mobilization and then cast him aside. Um, f Trump has, in the past, they're making a little, some little noise about it now in the media, some connections with the mob. If they wanted to, they could have buried him months ago with this. I mean, p remember how Howard Dean was the anti-war candidate for a while. It was getting uh, lots of popularity. And then they buried him because they didn't want an anti-war uh, candidate because they took a, a campaign rally where he's kind of yelling and they jacked up the noise on the microphone, they made him look weird, and they just buried him. They could have buried Trump if they didn't want to increase the fascism and racist, and racist reaction. Um, but a lot of what is happening, the, the reaction and the, and the increase of reaction is the other side of the coin to a lot of what's happening right now, which is that there's an anti-racist rebellion happening on campuses. Are people following the anti-racist rebellion on campuses? I mean, I think that obviously our, a party like ours is going to pay like rapt attention to this. But I think that we're not paying as much attention as the ruling classes. And they are riveted by what's happening. But if you just take a, uh, Atlanta, at, uh, Emory College in Atlanta, there have been, they shut down traffic in the middle of, of Atlanta um, just a couple of days ago. They've been disrupting major intersections to protest the treatment of African American students. Um, Northern Arizona University, who, who have a list of demands, who they base their list of demands on the Emory College students. They just had a, a meeting with the president and the, the uh, African American and Latino students met with the president. White students camped out in the hallway leading up to that office. And so there's pictures online that you can see all the, the uh, supporters sitting on the floor, about like 20 or 30 of them, while there's a meeting inside, while students present their list of demands. Towson University in Maryland, students met with the president until past midnight to get him to agree to all their demands, which he did. Uh, Northwestern University, there was a, a dedication of a new sports field, and they were going to have this big you know, event where they invited everybody, invited the media. The, the protesters crashed it with their demands to, against racism. And then there's Missouri, which was, of course, so historic. Uh, the, stu the, the football players went on strike. A student went on hunger strike. They got support from m much of the faculty. And um, what's happening on campuses is what I would call historic, and I really I've become annoyed as an activist over the years at the constant use of the word historic to describe something that's good. But I really feel like the conditions on campus that students are describing have been going on for decades. And this is a point where people are saying, we're not going to take this racism anymore. And I think we should, in building for the 20th, we should find a way to tap into this. I think it would really help make this a strong rally that opposes both the reaction that's happening, the racist reaction that's targeting Muslims, the reaction against the Black Lives Matter movement, and against every sector of our class. And I think it should also be an invitation to anti-racist whites to come out, too. I think we should make it that as well. Um, so I have no more on my report, um, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks.